almost there. All right. Wonderful. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. We have a minute or so before we start. So please do make yourself comfortable. Say hello. Let us know that you're here. We're back after quite a long time. So I would love to hear from everybody who's with us today. And uh, yeah, tell somebody who might be interested. They still have a minute or so to hop on and join us here. And we will get started very, very shortly. How big a crowd do you feel will be joining? Uh, we shall find out. We have a few people with us already. It usually takes three to six minutes for everybody to sort of trickle in. So we'll start, uh, yeah. we'll start yeah. slowly, Henry. All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Partition 73. We are a good few weeks away from uh, when, we end, when we ended the series, um, or when we thought we ended the series. And, you know, as with all good conversations, this one also just kept going. And after the series um, ended on August 16th, we had so many messages coming in of people sharing their own personal stories, um, people expressing, you know, what they had learned from all the different views that we heard. And just to cast your mind back, you know, we spoke about personal experiences, we talked about food, we talked about culture, we talked about architecture, we talked about music, we talked about Hindus, we talked about Muslims, we talked about Hyderabad, we talked about Christians, we talked about Karachi, we talked about Delhi, we talked about Lahore, we talked about Bombay. So we really did talk, you know, touch at least on several different aspects of, uh, of 1947. Um, and the last two, as you may remember, were very special. We ended with my two grandmothers who both had firsthand experiences of 1947, but albeit in very, very different ways. You know, we had my daddy whose family sort of lost a lot at that time and came over and had to restart in Delhi. And then you had my nanny's family that were sort of spectators to partition because they didn't physically have to engage in sort of a lot of movement. And so, you know, after these conversations, I realized that partition in, in my family, at least, has, has often been told as a story of loss. Like that has, that has overwhelmingly been the theme when we, as a family, talk about what partition meant to us. You know, it, it's less about the freedom and it's more about the loss. Um, and, and so I guess subconsciously in my mind, that's sort of the narrative that's been built and, and what I have thought of it initially as is that. But after we, after we finished those conversations, I was speaking with my, um, one of my best childhood friends, Mariam, who I, who I referenced in, a, in an argument about Basmati rice, as anybody may remember in one of the, in one of the sessions. And we started talking and, and she was talking about her family and her grandparents that experienced partition and you know where they came and where they went to or where they were and where they stayed. And she was very, very gracious to introduce me to her grandfather who is with us today. And I am really honored that we are going to be able to speak with him to hear a firsthand experience of partition from the other side of the border because I think it's just, it's invaluable and we have to hear all of the sides in order to understand the issue in 
in anything close to entirety. Um, and so with, you know, as we as we speak today, I'm really interested to hear a firsthand experience from the other side. And because some of the other experiences we heard from our Pakistani panelists were from, you know, second and third generation folks, not from folks who experienced partition. So without further ado, I would really like to introduce to all of you Mia Tariq Mustafa, who I will refer to as uncle through, the, through this, um, and who is Maryam's grandfather and how I have heard of him referred to for many, many years now, but this is the first time that I think we actually get to speak with one another. So thank you so much, uncle, for being here. I'm really, really honored that you take, took this time. Thank you, Ragni, it's a player to get this opportunity of joining your discourse. And before I say anything more, I'd like to say that I listened in to your interview of your nanny. And I was amazed, absolutely amazed to hear her talk about her early days, uh, how living in spacious bungalows and uh, having uh, sleeping outside in summer with mosquito netting. <laughs> yeah, and um, you know, um, um, other, other, other things like um, mothers putting you to sort of take a siesta <laughs> in the middle afternoon when it was, you know, hot summers because right. in Lahore, where we lived most of the time, the temperature was often 115 plus, you see. Right. And the important thing was that you waited till the mother sort of dozed off and then you rushed out and took the opportunity of playing. And <laughs> in my case, I would jump over the fence of our big house and there was a school yard, uh, a field, playing field. And there we would play Gulli Danda. Oh. Other people would join. And I have great uh, fond memories and regard for that game, although that's going out of fashion right. in both India and Pakistan, I think. In Punjab, it was very popular. Because looking back, I feel that Gulli Danda gave me the advantage. It sharpened my reactions. You know, you don't know which way the Gulli would go. Mm. And you have to quickly react and hit it with the danda. Yeah. And that develops your reaction. Right. And I found subsequently that I became, uh, I developed into, a, I got an opportunity and became a hockey goalkeeper and we'll be sort of touching on that. And there, the coach who selected me, he used the words that you have very good reactions, you see. And then later in my career, I had a driver um, from the Indian Army, in the British Indian Army, uh, old timer, taught by the British. And I would often drive that Jeep myself. And he said, Saab, I must say that your reaction, your anticipation is very good. And I ascribed that to Gulli Randa. To the days so, of Gulli Randa. <laughs> similarity, it, it's frankly, uh, you know, it, it was amazing. Yeah. So, coming Hello. back to our family, we, I start with my grandfather because he, the family belonged to Talwandi Pira near Nakodar, near Jalandhar. But the, he moved in the 19, uh, 1880s. And the occasion was that the British were developing the Chanab Ravi Duaba. Okay. They were building canals in order to use the fertile soil so that crops could be grown there and the British would tax, collect their taxes, you see. So the project had been completed, but the British being good planners, they realized that the locals there living there, the indigenous people were junglies. And uh, they had little idea of agriculture. So they invited families from Jalandhar and Hoshiarpur, agriculturist families, which were mostly Muslims and Sikhs. Hindus were not 
you know, that given they were more in trading and other things, education. So Dada, who was a manager of Raja of Kapoorthala's lands and was well versed in agricultural practices and revenue matters, mm. he was invited by the Deputy Commissioner, Mr. Lyle, uh, to help in the settlement of Lylepur. So that's how our male side of the family settled in Lylepur. And uh, it so happened that being good at it, the pattern was that the British would allot few murabbas, something like five murabbas to all the people and you were supposed to uh, pay as you earn basis kind of thing. And grandfather did a good job and there were others who did not do good jobs. So he bought them out and within 10 years or so, he ended up with 80 murabbas in that fertile Faisalaba or Lailpur lands. And that way, he kind of became the first family of uh, uh, Lailpur. Lailpur, okay. Yeah. And uh, Dada had four sons and one daughter. And they all did well. My uncle, Hafiz Abdullah, he was a member of the National Assembly in Delhi. And my father, Mia Nurullah, you will be seeing their pictures. He was a member of the Punjab Legislative Assembly. He was an MLA for dozens of years. And uh, they played a, a role both in the development of Punjab as well as in the uh, creation of Pakistan. And so we, we will be talking a little bit more about that. So, coming to my own, uh, my father had uh, eight kids, four boys and four girls, and he was educated in, uh, what is it, the, uh, uh, at 86, you know, I sometimes forget the, the famous school in London, the economics, London School of Economics. Thank you. He graduated from there and uh, came back uh, and joined politics. He so he was, moved away from agriculture? Was he the first generation to move away from, from, ag from the management of agriculture? What happened was that agriculture, in fact, now if I go into those details, Dada was a great planner. He had four sons. So he said the eldest son who graduated from government college Lahore will concentrate on agriculture after him for the family, right. for all of them. So he'll be a specialist of agriculture. Number two son, he said, would be an irrigation engineer because of the canals and the water question. So he went to UK in City and Guilds College to do engineering. Uh, civil engineering, you know, irrigation. Number three, he said, would be a religious scholar. He will go and, and, and this is Hafiz Abdullah, the man who became Central Assembly member. He went to Darun Nadwa in India, the religious school, and subsequently to Al Azhar. So all three specialized in areas which Dada had assigned. So he was obviously a great planner. I right. wish I had known. But by the time my dad, uh, Dada passed away when he was hardly 10 years old, my dad. So he didn't have the benefit of Dada's advice. He was helped by the brothers and he made his own decisions. And he went to England for surgery of a knee which he had damaged. But he ended up enrolling in London School of Economics. And then he came into politics. Wow. So, uh, so we consider Faisalabad, uh, Lailpur as our primary sort of place of origin. But dad uh, married in, in, in a family in Lahore, inside the walled city, Lohari Mandi, mm. 
inside Lohari gate, one of the, I think, 12 gates of Lohar. Right. So we treat both, uh, we treat both uh, uh, Lailpur and Lahore as our places of residence and our principal education was in Lahore. And again, I come back to your nani. She said that she went to convent school. So did I. I went to convent school in Lailpur and to Queen Mary's College for my primary education. Oh, wow. so this uh, similarity was, you know, just mind-boggling. <laughs> Wonderful. So, Should I put up some of the photos that we have to talk through? Yes, please. Yeah. So here we have a view of Lailpur. When it was created, it was the only planned city in India. And on the right, you see right. it's planned, almost like a Union Jack. And the interesting thing is, and on the left, you see what is known as the Ghantagar. I wonder if one of your uh, viewers is from Lailpur or Faisalabad. They would quickly recognize that. The circular bazaar and the eight bazaars intersecting in the middle with the Ghantagar. And the land for both the Ghantagar as well as the circular bazaar and the Jamia Masjid of Lailpur was donated by my grandfather. So oh, okay. you know, he had a, a good hand in the uh, development mm, of, the of the city. Wow. The DC Lyle subsequently became Lieutenant Governor of Punjab. So their friendship continued, you see. So next, please. Now here is, on the left, you see my grandfather. And on the right, you see Mr. Lyle uh, and the, their, uh, sort of the two were friends. And, and where are these photos, Uncle? Oh, these are, you know, one is, I think, a government college emblem. I no, no, sorry. Where are these photos housed? The frames, where are they all? They have created a, recently a museum in Lailpur, okay. which I have yet to see. And these, uh, this has been taken from an uh, exhibit room in the museum in Lailpur. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Wow. Next, please. Now here on the left side, you see our family. Uh, who's missing here? One is missing, a daughter who came 16 years later. <laughs> so she is <laughs> not in So it's four plus three. And on the right, we have the Dal Lake in Serenagar. Mm -hmm. Dad standing in the middle. And this is where we spent one or two summers. And not only Dal Lake, our family before partition went to Dalhousie, Simla, and Masuri, and Dehradun. And I remember one of my ambitions was I was all prepared to enroll in the Dune School. Oh, really? Partition came. Yeah. And that ambition had to be given up. You see. Next, please. Here are mother and father. Uh, you what can guess photos from, these are? From, he was a dandy from London. He had, you know, tail coats and bowler hats and that sort of, sort of thing. But after partition, he changed. And okay. you will see that photograph also. He grew a beard. And on the right, my mom from Lahore, inside Lahore, Lahori Mandi. Mm -hmm. And well, she was my mom, but she was also a very beautiful lady. She was indeed, absolutely. And can I just ask, Uncle, like when you were, um, maybe even when you were very young and maybe even before you were born, since your, you know, your family was so closely associated with the establishment of Leyalpur, 
from the very beginning. Uh, what was the relationship like with the British administration in Punjab? Very cordial in those days yeah. because a new city was being developed. Right. And it suited both sides to cooperate, you see. British were interested in development because they were interested in getting revenues. Yeah. And the people would benefit. So it was a win-win situation. And uh, uh, since we are talking of uh, Lailpur, I should mention that our family, our, my dada, created his main residence in a mohalla, which is today a big mohalla known as Abdullapur, named after my uncle. Okay. And my dad moved on the other side of the railway lines, and he also built a big spacious house in a mohalla which he named after me, Tariq Abad. So oh, Tariq Abad are, they are now virtual small towns. They are, they are huge. Mm -hmm. These mohallas, I mean, they would, hundreds of thousands would be the population wow. of Tariq Abad and Abdullah Abad. That's fascinating. Next, please. Uh, this is a uh, plastic photograph of the top echelons of the Muslim League, Mr. Jinnah in the center, Chundrigar, and on his right, I am slipping the name, is the Hindu gentleman who became one of Pakistan's ministers, that is second from the left, you see. Uh, sorry, the name is slipping at the moment. And the circled one is uh, Hafiz Abdullah, my uncle. And interestingly, I may point out that my dad had more Hindu and Sikh friends than Muslims. Really? Yeah. Uh, in particular, Sir Chotu Ram, people may recognize his name. He was a very well-known Hindu leader. Uh, uh, and then Sardar Sampuran Singh, he was a member of the Central Assembly and Sardar Bishan Singh. These were well-known personalities and my dad and Sir Chotu Ram, they piloted the Zamidara Act in Punjab Assembly, which gave the Zamidar certain rights vis-a-vis -vis the uh, administration, you see. So your question, those were good days. They were, you know, Assemblies were operative. They were not just the British allowed, but they were of course controlled in the sense that defense and foreign affairs and all that was strictly out of their purview. But local issues, local matters. In fact, uh, I, I remember dad telling us that he built a spacious house, a uh, bungalow close to the railway station and his Hindu friend, who was a barrister, and they, they, they were both together in London, he said, Mia, you are building this house at the wrong place. It's close to the city. And I tell you, you will pull it down with your own hands. The fact is that dad didn't pull it down, but we had to pull it down because it had been encircled by population right. and it had become too commercially valuable. So now it is a market. Okay. The house is gone. So next, please. Now here we are coming to my activities. On the left is our family on the beach in Karachi, uh, siblings. I am encircled and I got into hockey. I was a goalkeeper and I got picked up in school. So I had the good fortune. I was good at it. So I played for Central Model School for Government College Lahore, for University of Punjab. And in my very first year, when I was only 17 years old, I got selected as a reserve goalkeeper for Punjab. Oh. So that I ascribe it to my Gulli Danda days. <laughs> so that developed my reaction. And again, the coach said, your quality is that you don't fear the ball. And he was having difficulty in finding a goalkeeper. 
So fortuitously, I fitted into that. And this is Pakistan High Commissioner's team in London. And we participated in hockey festivals in Ramsgate, in Konokali Zoot in Belgium, and uh, in Bad Godesburg in Germany, and so on. You know, both India and Pakistan had very good teams, at least at one time. But the Europeans were clever with the introduction of the turf and with the, the game became faster and that suited the Europeans. They enlarged the Ds. So the strength of indo Park that was of dribbling, that was no longer uh, of that, that importance. Value. Now it was positioning and speed and Europeans can beat us in both of these things. So now nowadays, Europeans have the advantage and occasionally India still has a good team, but Pakistan has fallen behind. Next, please. And so this uncle, I'm assuming these, uh, this photo of your, your hockey team is mm -hmm. after partition. Is that right? Yes. This so is in many of the structures. 1953. And so did many of the structures that governed, you know, things like uh, intramural and professional sports, did many of those structures remain through the time of partition or was there sort of some unrest in the system that was then re-established? Exactly. Partition brought about in 1947 was upside down. We'll talk of that. Okay. Okay. Uh, we'll but uh, later on they got resumed. You see, I'll just finish with this. This is me and my wife in the Karachi. That would be 1962 when we got married. You see. Next, please. And here is the favorite one. Everyone's uh, favorite. <laughs> Down syndrome one. You can see that. And Down syndrome are considered disabled. Yes, nature made them like that. You know, in the case of Roshni. But you know, Rabia, she may be Down syndrome, but she has a clever mind. And I can't help sharing one story. Please. That, uh, she was sitting in Islamabad and one of her sisters brought, she's very fond of Kit Kat. And they brought, came from abroad and brought this big pack of, you know, Kit Kats in which there are small, about 40 or 50 Kit Kats. And interestingly, Rabia would call them always girls Kit Kat. And we could never understand why girls get cat huh. till that day. And that day, Rabia was not in a good mood. She was <laughs> sitting and she received this. And then came uh, three of her boy nephews. And they formed a line. Um, Babo Khala, <laughs> can we have no Kit Kat? And Rabia is normally, she was very sharing, cooperative. But that day, she was in no mood. She looked at them and she said, this is girls Kit Kat, you are boy, away. Now that gave a chance to the niece, Hafsa, daughter of one of my daughters. And she came up now that I am a girl and I'm going to get Kit Kat. So she stood there expectant, Babu Khala, may I get a Kit Kat? Babu was in no mood that day. She looked at Hafsu and she said, no, Hafshu, you look like a boy. Go. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, don't underrate them. And I'm sure you you know that. Yeah, already. absolutely. No, we've heard many stories about Babu Kala from Mariam and Natalia over the years. So she's very, yeah. very dear to us as well. Next, please. I think this is the end. Hi, okay. To so partition, there is a, a whole sort of background to it. It didn't happen just like that, right. I'm sure you're all aware that Indian National Congress in the 19th century, it was formed by the British yeah. and it contained Mr. Jinnah and Mahatma Gandhi. They were together important members of the Indian National Congress. It's not always known that Mr. Jinnah played a very important role early on, but somehow he got kind of disappointed with the reaction of the Congress. And that is when they formed the Muslim League. And that 
is how gradually the idea that although Muslims were a minority, only about 25%, but India's population is huge, even at that time compared to the other countries. So 25% was a very large number. It was too large in their opinion to be treated as a minority and they felt, and especially because Muslims were concentrated in the West and the Eastern part of India, Bengal. So that's how the idea came around. It gradually gelled with the Lama Iqbal 1940 that it would be best under the circumstances to have a separate homeland for the Muslims. Which is not to say that non-Muslims would have no place in it. They will. But it was felt that this would, they would be able to safeguard where they will be in a majority. So that was the underlying idea. And it wasn't partition. It was, they were quite willing to accept a kind of federation of India that separate, make it into two houses, but who would remain under a union government. And the Crips mission, which the British sent during the war around, I think, 43, that recommended a federation, that recommended that Muslim majority areas will be separated, but they will remain in a federation. And again, it is not generally pointed out, Muslim League accepted it, but it was Congress who rejected it. Muslim League's viewpoint was also that the division should take place on a provincial basis. Province should be treated as the unit of division. But the Congress side succeeded in convincing the British that these two large provinces, Punjab and Bengal, needed to be partitioned. Muslim League didn't like it, but they had to lump it. But otherwise, if you really think about it, you have to agree on a principle. And what would you treat as the unit if not a province? Would you treat a district or a town? That would create all kinds of problems. You would have had districts within India where Muslims were in a majority and districts within Pakistan where non-Muslims would be in a majority. So it wouldn't really work out. So Pakistan felt Muslims were let down with the idea of partition of Punjab and Bengal. But as I said, this was a moth eaten Pakistan. But the leader said, okay, so be it. So the idea was not at all to separate yourself. As we said, there was so much commonalities amongst uh, at the social level. And yet the sad fact remains that in the workings of the Congress, Muslim, they had lost the confidence of the Muslims. And again, if you go back, you know, the British always treated Muslims as the threat in India from 1857 onwards. True, Marathas had become strong. True, Sikhs had ruled Punjab. But still, the British felt that the main threat was somehow the Muslims. And in support, I would mention that when Tipu Sultan in the south was killed at Saranga Patnam in the battle, a signal went out from the British Army headquarters in Madras, which said, Tipu has fallen, India is ours. Imagine the year 1800, Marathas are still there, six will have Punjab, Nizam was still there, but the British didn't care for them. They cared for Tipu. So somehow the British always treated the Muslims as a threat. So after Ghadar, it was a general policy to bring up the non-Muslim, meaning the Hindu and Sikh communities, and push the Muslims down, which was one of the reasons why the area which constituted Pakistan 
was underdeveloped even by Indian standards. Very few universities, I think only two, one was Punjab University, and even Sin didn't have a full university. And when partition took place, what is forgotten is, India was lucky to have a functioning government in Delhi, especially with Mountbatten as his governor general because of his friendship in Nehru. But what did Pakistan get? Pakistan had no functioning government, no capital, no funds. And were it not for Mahatma Gandhi, who went on a fast to push Patel and Nehru to release the funds for Pakistan, I think 50 million pounds, Pakistan may not have survived. This is a fact. And we owe it to Mahatma Gandhi, that gesture. So Pakistan started off with so many disadvantages. And yet the people were happy because they had their own homeland and they wanted good relationship with India. This was never, never amongst the leaders that uh, uh, you know antagonistic relationship. So but can I ask um, Uncle? You know, you you spoke about you know your father having uh, many Hindu and Sikh friends, and indeed, when I've spoken with you know my grandparents who lived in Lahore, it's very much the same story that you know there was there was nothing, and there was a lot of communal living, there was a lot of sharing on Eid, on Diwali, so on and so forth. Um, did that? as a whole amongst, I, we know popularly what happened sort of within the wide, wider population, but amongst the sort of upper echelons of society at that time, your family included, did those sentiments change quite dramatically at the time? Yes, Not dram yes. They, you see, riots started in Calcutta, not in Punjab. Right, right. Yeah. And that spilled over, and Punjab again was almost 50 50 mm. Muslims. And that news sort of triggered rioting here in, in Punjab, in Jalandhar, and Ambala, and Lahore, and Rawalpindi. These were the centers. And once it started, what were the causes? I think number one cause was Mountbatten himself. The British government had given a target of June 1948 right. to be the freedom of India. But Mountbatten, with his image of a dashing, action-oriented commander of the British royal family, he wanted to show that a job can be done quickly. And he moved the time scale to August 47, when they were ill prepared, you see. He pushed everyone, and there are books written about it. So, this moving ahead of the partition, for which there was no justification except Mountbatten's whim, meant to make two governments out of one, as I said. Right. You know, it's, it's a daunting task. But so, at that moment, the administration in Punjab was almost non-existent. Why especially? Because Muslim League had gone on a non-cooperation movement and all the Muslim League leaders of Punjab, including my dad, had been jailed by the British. So, in all, uh, so the few months before partition, when things got out of hand, there was no Muslim leader of no to control the mobs. So it was a tit for tat reaction. I know I used to cycle. We were living on Mal Road opposite the zoo on top of shopping area near Nido's Hotel. So I would cycle from there to Central Model School about two miles. And around that time, you were not looking in front, you were looking at your back because you were wondering whether somebody would stick a knife in you. You know, that kind of insecurity had developed, you see. And once this writing began, 
in Lahore, there were mahallas. There were Hindu mahallas, Shah Almi, and I think another couple of gates, majority Hindus. And uh, these were put on fire because, again, when people saw trains bringing dead bodies from, say, the East Punjab, and they would lose their reason. I, I, I think to talk of who is to be blamed is fruitless. Both sides behaved like animals. And so starting off with, with Mountbatten and the lack of Muslim leadership in Punjab, which contributed. And uh, so these were things, it, it just went out of hand. I think you put that absolutely right. To look at who to blame is absolutely fruitless. And um, I, I we don't even really know the number of people who perished in this. And it's easily probably around a million on each side. And 10 million got displaced. It was a cataclysmic. Uh, I mean, uh, I was then only 13 years old, but I remember, and dad was in jail. So, uh, one wondered how these things will end. And, and cycling, I used to pass in front of the Digasi building, which is, uh, you know, mentioned by your ancestral Nani Nani. Because they were a notable family and Digasi was a very well-known. Uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if dad had dealings with him. Mm. But, uh, you know, I, I don't know more. But so... Once it, it was a downward path and the place where things ended was with this mass migration. And again, when, you know, the rail and bus system was totally inadequate for this movement. Right. So people were forced to move on foot on the roads in columns. And you can imagine when these two columns cross each other, what would happen? These are the things which stoked the fires. And things simply went out of hand. I, I, I think this is why, perhaps rightly, people do not talk too much about it or write about it. Right. It was a shameful period of our history and it shows um, and the British were careless. They simply stayed away, kept out of this. Perhaps, I, I wouldn't say that, but it might even be that they were glad that here were two, divide and rule, let them fight. And in the end, we'll pick up. Mr. Jenna, there was another factor also. It was Nehru's friendship with the Mountbatten. And Mr. Jinnah, was a very legally correct man. And Lady Mountbatten hinted to Jinnah that offer Mountbatten to become Governor General of Pakistan also. And Mr. Jinnah, in his rigid legalistic fashion, he said, how can one man be head of two countries? You see? No. So let him be head of India. And that meant that Mountbatten now went over totally to right. the Indian. And they, in fact, the, the Pakistani historians have said that it was a deliberate attempt. Okay, you created Pakistan, but let us see how you will survive. Now, the policy about partition was that the states had a special treaty with the British over the years. And they were granted the rights, the Nawabs and the Rajas of the states to choose which country they would accede to. But the underlying message, even from the British, was that it will go according to population. Now, there were two major states, Kashmir and Hyderabad Deccan, which had an interesting situation that Hyderabad had a large Hindu, non-Muslim population with a Muslim Nawab, right. while Kashmir had a Muslim majority population with a Dogra ruler. So the expectation was 
how could hyderabad join pakistan mm. and of course mr patel being a strong man the interior minister of india he didn't even consider it and he moved indian troops into it without reference to or at least mount batten did object so whether the nawab of nizam of hyderabad wished it or not there was a fight but indian army very quickly extinguished the resistance and india simply absorbed hyderabad back when it came to kashmir pakistan naturally expected that the opposite will happen kashmir will go to pakistan and when the maharaja the dogra he delhi delhi mr jinnah ordered gracie who was commander of the pakistan army general gracie to move pakistan army into kashmir gracie delhi delhi he said okenlek in delhi is the supreme commander and that's the way it was so i need okenlek's approval so the matters were referred to okenlek who referred it to mount batten who was not in favor of pakistan who delhi delhi and in this delhi delhi the tribesmen of nwfp couldn't stand it any longer or they may even have been egged by sardar kayum the prime minister of nwfp because there were fightings going on in kashmir so the tribesmen moved into kashmir and they almost took over kashmir except the srinagar airport and this gave mr nehru the excuse because nehru was a kashmiri brahman he had special attachment with kashmir and india managed to move in into the srinagar airport and from the airport they brought in uh, there was no connection otherwise road connection with kashmir mm. so had it been a few days late or had the tribesmen been disciplined kashmir would have been absorbed by pakistan and they can hyderabad would have gone to india and things would have worked out well but as it happened it didn't work out that way indian army naturally pushed back those tribesmen by that time pakistan army entered kashmir and this stalemate of the ceasefire line took place now under all standards of partition population majority was to be the rule in which there is no question that kashmir should have acceded to pakistan hyderabad should have with all its wealth kashmir was just rocks if you like while hyderabad was jewels but uh so this is the background looked at from the pakistani view yeah. and once it went to united nations they decided plebiscite should be the answer very sensible but then why the plebiscite has not taken place again sorry to say mr nehru so that is how we have gotten into this intractable issue or if at all ladakh and jammu could have gone to india even that could have been one solution but to get the muslim majority areas and force them we have ended up with a stalemate like we are seeing today it's a pity but this is the problem you see that somehow we the two sides could not show the grace and the confidence in each other and tried i think to take advantage which has resulted and it could easily have been india pakistan united facing china today but you know what the position is today yeah city now that's uh, yeah no i i, I do agree with you that it, it is a real pity and it does seem as you use the right word it it seems intractable at least from you know where we stand today i was wondering though if we could maybe move to your personal account of partition you know you were 13 so your memories i'm sure are quite clear of of the time itself mm-hmm. and so i'd love to hear about you know your experience of the event itself and also some reflections on the changing nature of uh, punjabiyat in west pakistan you know because there in the in sindh for example you saw very multi uh, religious sort of identity where where people were sort of coming together and so i'd love for you to just talk a little bit about that changing identity that naturally came with 
with the uh, events of 1947? Uh, I'm not quite sure about the second part, but first one I can easily address that uh, at 13, but I was you know, quite active uh, uh, and our leaders were all in jail, but we would, the uh, Muslim League, the remnants would hold a, uh, every Friday, there would be a big jalsa outside Mochi Gate. Lacks of people. And after- And this is in Lahore, Lahore right? Lahore, yeah. After Dhuadar, <laughs> strong speeches. Right. We would form a procession, which would go on circular road into Anarkali, if people who know the geography of Lahore, Anarkali to Nila Gumbad and on to Mall Road. Now the British authorities would be ready at the GPO junction with their strong police force to stop this from going further because this mall led to the cantonment area. That's where the British residents, etc., were. So they would have their these these uh, lorries, which were known as black widows. They were, uh, you know, they had no windows, only slits. They were meant for prisoners. So there would be dozens of these lorries there, and they would take the ringleaders of the procession and uh, uh, jail them. And I was thirteen, and I tried to get amongst the front ranks. But our own people said, come on, young man, we like your enthusiasm, but you are too young to give yourself up, you see. So I remember the third time around, I told my mother that this time I'm going to offer myself for a rest because I was motivated. <laughs> our slogan used to be, Sine pe goli khayenge, Pakistan banayenge. You know, the sort of spirits were very high. Right. That third time around, I managed to sneak past uh, our elders and uh, I got into, this was evening, I think about five or six o'clock, just before sunset. So we were taken to the red, for red, lal uh, thana, near zoo, there is a big police station. Now, we were disgorged in the lawn and soon we learned that the jails were full and we were not going to be jailed. So what? Are we to be released? No. Came nightfall, no food, no drink and at about 12 o'clock we were asked to get back into the buses. And then we couldn't see where we were headed. It was nightfall. But what they did was go on one of these highways towards Amritsar or towards Rawalpindi or towards Lailpur and then start releasing people one by one. And when my turn came, it was dark, middle of the night, about two o'clock, Sunsan, Biaban. <laughs> <laughs> I was, you know, asked to get off, you see. And the bus went away, so I was alone. I was a little frightened. But then, you know, how the crowd organizes itself. It was natural that I thought of slogans. Allahu Akbar, God is great. And from a distance, the sound came, very muffled sound, Allahu Akbar. So it meant that there was somebody at the other end, you know. Right. And we started walking towards each other. And it turned out later that we had been dropped between Lahore and Amritsar. But those were there were a few for a few moments, you know, I was really frightened. Mm. But within a matter of half an hour, we had streams of Muslim leaguers on bicycles coming from both sides. And they had brought food and they had brought water. So it was a picnic, you see. And by early morning, I was back with my mother. She was a little worried. But knowing my spirit, <laughs> I had been warning her. She said, you really did it. <laughs> so that was the spirit, I would say. Right. But on the fear side, uh, my nana was living in a haveli. 
and just across the gully inside Lahore, there was a Brahman family, Kashmiri Brahman Hindu family, and they were friends. But when these writings took place, one of the method of the writers was they would set fire to the doors because doors are made of wood. You see, mm. what people did was they had these uh, ghee tins and they cut that tin and then they would nail it to the door so that no part of the wood was now visible. And hence this was a defense to somebody who casually threw a, a lighted torch. You see. Mm. All that was done but when the time came that mass migrations were taking place and killings were at their peak then of course there was no choice that Kashmiri Brahman family even when they were supported by Nana Abu's family they could not stay there. They had to. Safety demanded for them to leave. We never knew what their fate was. But and uh, and uh, another incident I would say we were living on Mall Road as I said but when the mass migration took place, one of his friends, dad's friends, was Justice Bakshi Take Singh, uh, Take Chan. And he had a big uh, bungalow behind the Lahore uh, courts. Uh, you know, the, uh, and uh, Bakshi Take Chan requested dad that. I have to leave with my family. You please come into our bungalow. Mm -hmm. So we moved from our flat on Mall Road into Bakshi Tekchan's house where we lived there for I think almost two years. And the method followed was Hindus had left more property behind in Pakistan because they were more prosperous. Mm -hmm. Muslims had, had left Fewer properties. So the migrants which came on each side, the government developed a, a refugee resettlement department. And their job was to make a list of all these properties and then match who had left more behind. It was a very difficult process, a very arbitrary process. And because there were more properties left behind by Hindus, the local Muslims tried to take advantage of it. It's unfortunate and this led to the beginning of corruption in Pakistan. So, you know, these were the side effects which nobody could have foreseen. Mm -hmm. I think, in a way, having that excess property, Mari, well, half of it was, uh, more than half were Hindu bungalows. Mm -hmm. I remember people even pulled the electric wires from there. They were gutted, you know. Who gained from it? On neither side. Yeah. It was terrible. All I can say is uh, the lesser one thinks and talks of it, how people could fall to, it was below animal behavior. Does that uh, respond to what you yeah yeah absolutely i was wondering if you could uh, if there are any um you spoke of you know the neighbors who who left but i was wondering from your school time you know you were 13 and you were in a convent school presumably again a sort of uh, a mixed patronage of the school as well so i was wondering like what was it like as a, as a school child also to go back to school after partition had taken place I, I was in, by that time, uh, this was middle school, I was in center model, which is a high school. Okay. Uh, I was in the convent during my primary years, you know. Actually, that stabilization took place pretty quickly. We kind of lost, I didn't lose any single year, totally. Mm -hmm. But we lost part of it, about six months, education was interrupted, and so on. But things, you know, this mass migration took a few months. That's about all. And once it had ended, then things settled down fairly quickly. 
Okay. Uh, that worry that I had, you know, how will it ever end? I could never imagine during partition, during the riots, how things will end. But then they ended, they settled down pretty quickly. Things and came back to... Across the board or do you think like... No, both, that... sides, both sides. No, sorry. Both I mean, across the board socioeconomically, did they settle down fairly quickly? Yes. For the migrants, you know, for, for those who had left their houses, of course, it took time. But for the rest of the community, yeah. it, it settled down. Governments re-established themselves. Things started working. Schooling was not... I mean, I, I didn't lose any year. Mm. No. Our examinations took place. Uh, so it had... I think the lasting effects were on the families which were forced to move. Yes. They had to face horrible situations, loss of lives, kidnappings, rapings, God knows what. So, I, frankly, I we heard things. My own brother who was three years older than me. He was in his second year in government college, Lahore. And Pakistan army, after the war, Muslims, shall we say, Muslim armies of British Indian army, they were still in Southeast Asia, Malaysia, that area. They had not yet come back in 47 to Pakistan. So Pakistan had very little resources. Once these caravans started moving, the idea was to give them some kind of a security. And my brother was a member of the UOTC, University Officers Training Corps. This was a British invention to get youngsters into UOTC and then into their academies and get into their armed forces. So they were taught how to use a rifle and a pistol, just that, basic training. So trucks were sent from Pakistan to help the caravans coming from Jalandhar and Ambala. And with these trucks, each one of them was given one guard. And this UOTC volunteered mm. to take a trip. And my brother, who was a sensitive person and already a little unusual, uh, he did that duty and mother says that he came back so disturbed that he his symptoms exacerbated. He almost lost his mind because you know he had to fire not for effect but from a distance when the attacks came on the caravans and he saw people dying right, left and center and a person could lose one sanity. And in our family, that was one instance right. where we suffered. But it was on, on duty, you see. He was serving a purpose. And I'm sure that similar things happened mm -hmm. on the other side. Yeah. So, wow, that's, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, we've in many of the interviews, we've touched on this idea that the human experience for every single individual who experienced partition was so deep that our history can only be written through bringing these experiences to light because the books will only tell us so much. So thank you for sharing that. So uncle, I have one um, last question for you, but before I ask you that, is there, is there anything else that, that you would like to share with everybody listening before I ask you, ask you my last question? I think your time is up. I don't know. I have, there is a lot to talk about. I know we could, absolutely. So but I think you touched on the sort of main uh, uh, issues, you see. Yeah. I'd be happy to have any questions. Uh, yeah, we have some. Now, you know, uh, allow me to sort of end by saying that, you know, I always say that in a family, for unity, it is the elder brother who has to take the initiative. If he is graceful, gracious, and does his duty, chances are 
then the rest of the family will remain in line. And India being seven times the size of Pakistan, one expects, hopes, prays that India would behave like an elder brother, you know, have a, have a, have a heart if you like. But the, sorry, the feeling in Pakistan is not that, you see. So I don't want to get into current politics, yeah. but you've seen that even within India now, unfortunately, things are not, both in India and Pakistan, I would say. But India, uh, earlier on, under Manmohan Singh was doing so well. Mm. But situation today is not very hopeful. Mm. Yeah, I have a couple of questions here from, from folks who've been watching. One question is, did you miss any friends who had to flee from what became Pakistan? Or were the sentiments of partition too overwhelming at that point to sort of process that, that uh, human separation? No, we were friends, but we lost touch. Okay. I could not maintain contact. There was no way. You didn't know where they had gone. Yeah. Even in UK, I, I remember uh, in my days in London at the university, I had a Krishan Kumar Berry, I remember his name. Mm. And there was another sick gentleman, a uh, boy. Uh, I can't recollect his name now, imagine. But Barry and we were very good friends. We went to on a trip to Spain together in a car. Uh, and Barry's dad, I know, was in Delhi. He was in auto business, auto spare parts. But we lost touch and uh, could not uh, maintain contact. Although we were, we went to Eiffel Tower <laughs> and <laughs> remember we used to play bridge together. Yeah. And uh, 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 under Eiffel Tower. River Seine passing by, Barry and I got into an argument. Uh, I said that I can jump into the river. <laughs> he said, come on, Tarek, you are bluffing. You can't do that. <laughs> said, All right, I'll do it. So we were carrying a swimming trunk. In the car, I changed into my trunks, yeah. walked in the middle of the bridge, River Seine in Paris. <laughs> I lost my nerve, you know, because... From a distance, the height doesn't look forbidding. But yeah. when I was in the middle of the bridge, right. it was about 30 feet. <laughs> and there were barges, barges in, in the river. Mm. But now, how could I lose to right. my uh, Hindu friend? You see, I, I had to. So I jumped. I <laughs> made that jump. And I managed to swim across and come out. And what was at the end of it, I won my bet. And what was the bet? The bet was that in London, we will go to East Allgate. There was a Jafferji restaurant. Okay. You know, remember, this is 1954, yeah, around that time. And they would have parathas. You know, Jafferji made very good parathas. So the bet was that Krishan Kumar would buy us, all four of us, a good lunch. So for that, I was prepared <laughs> to make that jump into the river. <laughs> to go to <laughs> any lights. <laughs> I, I wish if somebody knows that family in Delhi, auto parts was his dad's business. And I don't know what Krishan ever did. Well, that. if anybody but was... Perhaps, you know, I am not good at, I, I think even not only with my Indian friend, I have not been able to keep up it's my fault. Perhaps another person may have done a better job. Yeah, no, absolutely. Though I think it is difficult. I remember in the, uh, I think it must have been the very early 2000s, uh, the Government College of Lahore had an event for all of their alma mater and um, my dadaji was able to go back. And I think for them, that was the first time they had any contact with either the people themselves or their families, you know, after uh, after partition. So, yeah, it was it was difficult at those times to keep in contact. Government College Lahore was one institution, and the second was the Women's Canard College. Okay. And my wife Akhtar, who went to Canard College, they had this function, and she actually made contact with one of her friends. Oh wow! In that, yeah, it happened. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, I think, you know, we hear the, the um, we hear all of these stories of such incredible and heartbreaking brutality around the time of 1947, but yet there are just as many stories of, um, of goodness, you know, and of yep. protection and of the human spirit and of a shared identity and a shared land and a shared history, so on and so forth. And so I, I mean, I just wish we could bring more of that, more of that delight on a, on a more larger scale than, you know, between us all individually where it very much exists. I totally share that. And quite honestly, again, I don't want to make a pitch for it. You take Kashmir out and wh why can't we come to a settlement? And if that irritant can be removed, I don't yeah. see. But, you know, today the situation has become more complex. Right. Now China jumped into the equation. Right. America, at one time, it was America and India couldn't get along. Now America and India cannot do without each other. <laughs> Imagine <laughs> how things have... How the world changes, yeah. That's a small appendage, still. So we may have nuclear parity and all that, yeah. but in the end, we can't compete with India and we shouldn't even try that. I wish we could have this elder brother, younger brother relationship, mm. but I submit that the initiative has to come from India. <laughs> the elder brother, simple. Yeah. 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 Hopefully we within our lifetimes, hopefully we see some movement towards reconciliation, if, if not. Yeah, I'm all for it. Yeah. I'm all so, for just it. my very last question to you uh, before we close this evening is, you know, you have seen a nation from its inception to, you know, 70 years of growth, 70 plus years of growth of, of the nation itself. And so I was just wondering, you know, it, it's a very rare, human experience to see the building of a nation state within one's lifetime. So I was wondering if you could share any reflections on the observation of such a great political occurrence within your, within your uh, lifetime and your changing perspective over time as you, you know, grew from a teen into adulthood as well. Well, Pakistan, uh, if you're referring to creation and development of Pakistan, yes, it passed through a number of phases with the sudden departure of Mr. Jinnah. Mm. And then we lost Liaquat Ali within two years. Now these were the two stalwarts of the Pakistan movement. And after that, the political leadership, you see, bulk of the Muslims were Baderas, were landowners. And they hadn't governed, a little experience of that. As I said, there was no functioning capital. There were no government buildings. There was no communication system. In fact, it is to the credit of those early pioneers, how they could even keep the country together, you see. But it was done. But our political leadership in the mid-50s couldn't agree on a constitution. It took a long time for Pakistan. While the army, British trained, well organized, was always a strong unit. And it was not the army, Ayub Khan, who came in. It was a civil servant, Sikandar Mirza and Ghulam Muhammad another civil servant who displaced the politicians, that if you don't come to an agreement, they tried to take over. And naturally, the army was sitting on the side and they couldn't sit idle. And then simply Ayub Khan pushed away Sikandar Mirza and took charge. And ever since, Pakistan has willingly, you may even say, suffered from army domination. Right. That brought, yeah. Uh, and through the 60s, Pakistan did very well. We were forging ahead. PIA, Planning Commission, um, these were institutions which were working well. The Pakistan's 
GDP growth rate was 6% through the 60s when Ayub Khan was in charge compared to India's 4%. Now, the ratio of 6 to 4 is misleading because our population in both countries growth rate is 2.5 to 3%. So once you take this out of the 6 and 4%, the net growth rate in Pakistan was 3 and in India was 1. So Pakistan was developing 3 times faster than India through the 60s till the 71 war. Right. I don't want to go into that, you see. Yeah. But that was the watershed for Pakistan. Pakistan's civil administration did not, I think, give a fair share to East Pakistan. Mm. Bengali had a grouse, right grouse. Yeah. Justification of Ayub was that yes, you, we don't have the resources to develop both East and West. West is the bigger part. We develop West and then we will pull you up. But this was not acceptable to East Pakistan. And, you know, so and I think there are a lot of politics of identity yeah, and language that come yeah. into this as well. Mrs. Gandhi naturally took advantage of the situation mm. and she managed <laughs> with, with the help from that side, Mukti Bahini and all that. Uh, that's a long story. Yeah. But yeah. In, 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 it's, it's good. Bangladesh has done well. In fact, it's amazing. They were dependent on jute alone. But now they are export oriented. Yeah. In fact, you know, at one time, I was so hopeful in the 80s. Honest to God, I'm saying that my expectation was China will get the manufacturing and India will become the leader of software through the 80s. Unfortunately, again, India has done well, but not as well as it could have done. Yeah. Mr. Manmohan Singh, he had the benefit. You know, he was Secretary General of the South Commission. That was a major advantage for India. No country, none of the developing countries, including Pakistan, Nerede of Africa was the chairman of this, and Mr. Manmohan Singh, sitting in uh, Geneva, was the secretary of the South Commission. That is a valuable report Absolutely. on how developing countries can develop. No country took advantage of that, Nerere's report, except India, because Manmohan Singh, the very author of the report, became your prime minister. That was a yeah. lucky break for India, and India did very well in the 90s. I think we've uh, politically devalued education some amount in both countries, but there was a time that it was held in very high regard. We, are, we have not managed to take advantage of our built-in advantage. Both our subcontinent is good in mathematics, in abstract thinking. Bengalis and South Indians are even better than mm. Pakistan, but both are good. And we have not taken advantage of that. We could have had India taken the lead in software. Today, I think you would have been world leaders. India has done well, but not as much as it could have done. It's not dominant. Yeah. Like China has is dominant. Yeah. yeah. There is that opportunity. Yeah. And why? Because of our internal friction. And that why? because of this damned Kashmir thing. I'm sorry, I get emotional. No, please don't apologize. It's uh, There was a comment here that I read a little while ago, and I, I think I uh, agree with this, uh, is that this is, someone has said that this has been one of the best uh, sessions of the series. So thank you so much. This has been uh, really, really interesting. I have many questions. I hope we can connect again later. I would love to hear your thoughts on, on several issues around this. I have several questions that have popped up, but for the reasons of time, I think we might have to, to wrap this up. So thank you so much, Uncle. This has been very, very I, special. One last observation. We've been talking of India, Pakistan. Yeah. I'd like to talk about the world. You know, we are citizens of the world. Absolutely. 
developments have taken place satellites internet it knows no boundaries and what a mess we have made of united nations you see because we cannot get out of this mentality of nations we are one human brotherhood when will we understand that if we can work together what a change it can be what a win win situation it can be why do we have to have nationalism give me one justification these are all man made boundaries nature doesn't care for these things here here i couldn't agree with you more what well, a beautifully put and absolutely my submission is to our indian friends and let's work towards that you know we will probably have difficulty in settling our disputes but if we can settle overall human kind disputes so i am working on this what i call future of human kind because that's what we need to pay attention to is and to my way of thinking nationalism is old fashioned now the earlier we give it up you know the kind of world which is shown in in star trek that's the kind if we want to we can conquer the stars if we get together china's manufacturing india's software capability put it together why not so thank you thank you for giving thank me thank you so much thank you so so much uncle this has really been been special and i think your parting thoughts are very fitting and very beautiful and uh, unfortunately maybe a little bit too evolved for today's politicians but hopefully they will also come to those conclusions uh, sooner rather than later in the future so thank you so so much one quick last proposal okay. unless we strengthen the united nations unless we give it independent power unless it has its own force for that it needs money where will the money come from countries nations america withdraws russia doesn't give its dues so i have proposed look at the common resources of the world antarctica arctic the moon the orbits give it to the united nations why are we fighting for these things if un has these resources then un can tax them anybody can benefit from resources within the high seas right pro but bit taxes to the united nations once un has its independent finances then it will become a power thank you thank you thank you so much uncle really this has been incredible very enjoyable there are lots of comments appreciating your uh, your insight and your perspective and so just thank you for sharing so openly with me this evening thank you for this opportunity absolutely and i and thank i hope that everyone. we hope you've all heard that thank you everyone for tuning in once again today um you know i i also wish we could hear just more and more perspectives that every conversation is so enlightening every conversation is so interesting i definitely learn a lot new and i hope you know all of you do as well um thank you for your engagement thank you for coming back and good night